Bonjour, bonsoir, dear friends, and welcome to JCB Live. Happy hour today directly from the fabulous Red Room at Raymond Vineyards. We're going to have today an amazing time. We're going to dive into history with one of the award-winning Emmy Award television. She's a producer, an executive director, a writer. She was obviously on CNN for many years as well. She holds a fantastic graduate degree from the famous University Berkeley in journalism, naturally. She's written, she speech, she collaborates with a bankrupt library, with the Smithsonian. She's a star. Her father as well ran the Wine Institute. He's a great friend. She has an amazing brother who is a fabulous banker. Well, the family, they are genius. I'm very pleased to bring today to the Red Room in direct of Napa Valley, the famous, fabulous Carla De Luca. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> Oh, Jean-Charles, thank you so much. You couldn't be uh, more generous with that introduction. And as a behind the scene all these years to um, enjoy you and be invited today to uh, visit with you is just a thrill. So thank you so much. Well, we are thrilled, Carla. So let's have a toast. Absolutely. Salute. We'll do it in Italian because I know your Italian is fabulous and this is your <laughs> origin, right? I have to work on it. Centani to you. Molto grazie. Molto grazie. So, Carla, we've been friends for many years. And I had the pleasure to not only see your amazing documentary and to welcome it in Buena Vista in the Caves that we showed to many guests, to see you at the Smithsonian talking about it and showing it to this famous museum in DC, you've done something incredible. So why don't you tell us about it? Because the title I think is genius and I have so many questions on this topic. Praised by poets and philosophers, adventurers, and the common man, good wine has been touted as a life-enhancing complement to good food and company, if, as Shakespeare reminds us, it is well used. Just beyond its delights lay the pitfalls of intoxication and the struggle between wine's celebration and condemnation so defines its history. For nearly 14 years in the United States, from 1920 to 1933, prohibition was the answer to an age-old question. What is alcohol's place in society? Well, no one could foresee what the consequences would be for the public in general, and the wine community in particular, and how prohibition's legacy continues today to influence legal issues recurring in the Supreme Court debates on public policy between ideology and science, religion and politics, and a modern wine industry that has achieved a competitive international reach in today's global economy, rebuilt by the determined optimist called the Phoenix Generation. Uh, Jean-Charles, thank you so much. And it's a special um, chance for me to also thank you for being one of the early supporters of the film. Uh, if you remember, even before we met, we were communicating about it and you kindly allowed us to use some video from the winery as well as uh, some uh, wonderful scenes from Raymond uh, that we incorporated when we uh, told most of the story. So I'm, I'm delighted by that and I thank you. Always uh, a pleasure. And when he deals with history, we are so supportive because History defines us. Knowing our past is essential to understand who we are and hopefully to have a greater future. So we got to dr drink to history. Oh, absolutely. Well, then I agree, Jean-Charles. And I think that's one thing we connected on 
if you remember the first time we met, I brought with me some of the Edward Moybridge series of photos of Buena Vista that are very special. You have them and they are also in the Bancroft collection. And that was one of the most special things working with the Bancroft Library. Initially, I had the idea for the film after attending a luncheon with uh, many of the most uh, uh, leaders and special families who were invited to come together to celebrate the 70th anniversary of Prohibition's repeal. And uh, my father had arranged it at Wine Institute. And we thought, what a special gathering. He asked me, given my background at CNN, if we could have it filmed. And I thought, terrific, wouldn't that be a great idea? Uh, but I also thought, wouldn't it be great to do something more to actually share with people the story of the vintners and the history, because so much, as you know, with the wine industry relates back to the period and the events of prohibition and repeal and how dramatically that impacted things. Carla, forgive me to interrupt. Did it no. really happen, prohibition in America, or is it just in history books an invention? Oh my goodness, did it ever. And there, I think what was one interesting aspect of this, it had never been documented in a film. And when I embarked on it, a number of the historians, uh, journalists, other people I talked to in the wine industry had said, great idea, but one reason it's never been done is we don't know that you're gonna have the visuals and the pictures. And while it was a daunting task, I thought, well, let's see. I didn't want to make that assumption having not done the research myself. And I think uh, what was wonderful is um, the perseverance that uh, my team that I was delighted to work with and the Bancroft researchers and those who helped me, most particularly Dr. Vic Gerasi, who was the food and wine historian that uh, started advising me and became the historical advisor of the film, uh, helped me and gave me hints on where to look. And so I started looking through different archives and things people hadn't really thought about, like the old newsprint and advertisements going way back to the period. I spent days combing through old magazines on the wine industry at UC Davis. And slowly but surely, we built a repository of about 3,000 images related to the period mm -hmm. as we reached out to wine families, the National Archives, different private collections, museums, libraries, and everybody was so wonderful in giving of their time, helping us to dig deep so that we had enough to sustain the story. And then of course, based on the luncheon I mentioned, we began a series of key interviews with the leading voices in the industry, most particularly the older generation. Mm -hmm. And I think it was a great help to me, but a signal to others that this was an important project that immediately Ernest Gallo, Robert Mondavi and brother Timothy, who were leading voices of the time, stepped forward and said, this is a great idea, let's do it. So they were the first people to agree to be on camera. And from that we built and I started to become a quick study because we felt time was of the essence. They were already in their eighties and nineties and it was an opportunity to record them. And they said after years of not having addressed the topic, uh, many of them uh, of the older generation had not been on camera but they were ready to do so. And so it was just really timing the um, ability to work with the Bancroft Library and the Regional Oral History, meeting Dr. Vic Gerasi. And then I also want to thank the Bancroft leadership. Yes. Had it not been for Charles Fall Haber, who was uh, president of, uh, of the Bancroft, still emeritus at the time, and uh, Elaine Tennant and Peter Hamp, they were instrumental in supporting the project which was the first time the Bancroft Library ever agreed to sponsor such an effort. They had made their collection available to others and the basis for working with them was in connecting with Vic, we went through the oral histories. They have one of the most special uh, oral history collections on a variety of topics with the California wine industry as one of their primary areas. 
So working through those archives, being able to access them, listen to the voices, find those photographs, that was just a tremendous uh, resource. And then in turn, we agreed that the interviews in their totality, because of course we're only using sound bites through the film, but the complete interviews are available in the Bancroft's collection, augmenting the already outstanding oral history collection that they had developed for decades. So that was very gratifying to work with them. It was the right uh, uh, synergies and the right um, people who really were very um, supportive, dedicated, and we all felt the same way about wanting to see the project succeed. And, well, um, and you did it, which is amazing. So Carla, let's jump into the past. Why prohibition? Why prohibition? Well, I think there were a number of reasons that it occurred. Um, most particularly, I think we all know that the uh, women's Christian temperance movement and uh, folks who were um, evaluating the challenges of that time were very concerned and rightly so about alcohol, its place in society and how to address alcoholism. Mm -hmm. There had developed saloon culture and not everybody was able to um, you know, work through uh, what would be the best public policy and how to address this. So the sense was we should just ban it because that's the, the easy solution. That's right. And yet not thinking about the cultural forces and with the immigrant uh, influx through immigration, so many traditions, that's where there is so much history. There are, uh, you know, precedents through uh, all different, uh, you know, religious services and celebrations and family meal time and the wine industry, certainly people who were vintners and winemakers saw it as, you know, part of their livelihood. So they, I think, did not anticipate those who were for prohibition, yes. that it would be very difficult culturally, it would also be extremely difficult to enforce. So while the 18th Amendment did garner enough support, came into effect, and we had that constitutional amendment, as you know, it was for uh, banning the manufacture, sale, and distribution of alcohol. Yeah. But you could actually still drink it, and home winemaking was still allowed, which was one of the things that I found fascinating learning about it. And I think that was a nod to understanding culturally it was a norm for people. Socially, it was part of the fabric of our society. So it was going to be difficult to change that, but they didn't anticipate, I think, that the um, societal pressures were going to be too great for it to be sustainable. And uh, during the period to support the, uh, you know, the effort of, uh, you know, uh, from, from the winemaker's point of view, uh, you know, they were entirely shocked they did not want their livelihoods to be lost. And so they were very clever, as you know, in shifting gears, not only through uh, growing more wine grapes that could be shipped back east for home winemaking, where those were the population centers, but also with creative things like jams and jellies and juices, just to get through the period. Um, but I think what was most remarkable for me in studying it is while there was this ban and difficulty and such a significant event as an amendment to our constitution. The entrepreneurs, the winemakers, many of them immigrants, did not lose sight of their belief that one day prohibition would be lifted and there would be repeal. So they had incredible perseverance and optimism. And I think that's why it becomes such a great story in American history and it had yet to be told and we were able to record the voices of some who had been there, who had lived through the period, as well as fill it out with these special images that had never been gathered before. So it was such a unique opportunity that I was grateful to be able to pursue and um, certainly couldn't have done it without my father's help, who was an incredible support and guidepost. And also um, through the 
uh, incredible response and receptiveness by the wine industry to help us with archives, to agree with interviews, et cetera. Well, and Carla, why did it last so long? Maybe you tell us how long it lasts, just to refresh everybody's memory, because a lot of our friends here who are with us tonight are from all around the world. So they may not even understand how could America, the most democratic country in the world, went through this long period of time when no alcohol was allowed. It is, you know, something unique to our history, isn't it? It began in 1920 and lasted until 1933. And I think it's very clear reflecting back and having interviewed historians, the late great Kevin Starr, remarkable person and expert on California history, and Thomas Pinney, who's written so many astounding books really to um, dig into these topics on the wine industry, really incredible research that he did. Um, essentially looking at, uh, you know, uh, what were the forces to move uh, to repeal, really the downturn in the economy as the Great Depression set in, there was a feeling that not only was this difficult to enforce, not only did it seem against the cultural and social fabric of much of the country as it was changing, but the economy was in despair. And Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, could see that. He felt it was something that he should uh, support and move on. And uh, certainly he did and did so with great support because uh, they knew that it just wasn't a sustainable event. So amazingly enough, a second constitutional amendment uh, be began uh, you know, getting momentum and the 21st amendment was put into effect. So really one thing that's unique about alcohol in America is it's the only product that essentially it's manufacture, sale and distribution is, is uh, been governed and impacted by two constitutional amendments. So that is unique to America, unique to our history. Uh, but I think that certainly uh, people see it as an anomaly and know that uh, while there were reasons for it then, we have learned so much more now. And in terms of the reasons for prohibition, as I mentioned, alcohol and handling it in America, alcohol abuse questions, which are very important. Uh, we have done so much more scientific research Mm -hmm. There has been so much more medical research of understanding these issues. And now, as we have just had the 87th year of repeal, a commemorated December 5th, 1933 was the date of repeal. <laughs> uh, we know that, yes, you want to drink to that. Oh, we got to have a toast to this because <laughs> we don't believe in prohibiting anything in the world. We for the free world. <laughs> Well, Especially yes. Everybody deals with alcohol and wine, right? Oh, yes. Well, listen, um, I think we know that it was a unique time. And I think people realize at 87 years now, we have much more knowledge about how to address alcohol, how to address alcohol public policy, um, which I think has been you know, incredibly important societally and um, also keeping in mind the cultural norms and the traditions that many people have. So, yeah, so let's, let's drink to this. <laughs> <laughs> well, so well said. So Carla, where can we all visualize this great movie that you've done? Because I've had the pleasure to see it. I hope everyone sees it. I know we're going to put some indication as far as the websites and where they can find it, but tell us as well. So, we can all see it again and be reminded uh, of that great event of history. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And we have appreciated so much support and interest in the film. Since the Bancroft Library is a special collections library and they have not monetized their collection, we felt that it, would, it was not something that they were prepared to sell, but we've tried to make it as available as possible for educational uses, for screening events, for people who are interested, journalists, historians, researchers, even on an amateur level. So making requests to the library uh, so that we can uh, pursue and work through those events. We try to honor as many requests as possible. We've made the film available and sent copies for 
uh, curriculum in schools. Uh, I've had high school teachers contact me, college professors. It's been taught in graduate classes, looking at the legalities related to the constitutional amendments and all the history and, and laws in America since then, but also public policy on health and globalization and looking at the changes in the wine industry at large. So um, we've had those requests, we've had international requests. So all I can say is we do the best we can and perhaps I'll never say never, there is still a hope that I have that we can make it even more widely available. Um, but as, as far as we can do now, uh, approaching the library, making requests and looking out for screening events, which we've been uh, holding since the beginning of, um, you know, uh, the, the completion of the film, I should say, uh, back uh, in 2009, the original award winning, winning cut, uh, we've had a number of incredible screenings at uh, your wineries, at uh, other wineries, museums, libraries, uh, theaters, different museum groups. And then of course, as you noted, uh, something that was quite special is we celebrated the 80th anniversary right. of Prohibition's repeal at the Smithsonian. So, and the, the film is also in the Smithsonian collection. Tell us about this amazing event we spent together as I'm serving Buena Vista wine. <laughs> ah, then I think we should move to that, right? Absolutely. Um, this is beautiful. You're gonna have to describe you. this wine because I want everybody to realize how much of a wine expert you are. And as you describe it, because this was the official wine we served together at this wonderful event honoring your film at the Smithsonian Museum in Washington, DC. So to you, Carla, for this, because this was a big deal. Well, well back to you, Jean-Charles, thank you. Oh, this is so rich, Jean-Charles. I, I never have professed to be an expert. That is your area. What I can say is I, I know what I like, and this is, this is certainly delicious and, and special. I think it has, um, the Buena Vista wines have a special earthy quality and terroir quality. I also think it has a, a wonderful um, brightness and, and mineral quality. And I think it's so complementary to so many foods. And I know that's something that, um, you know, food and wine go together. And we've always talked about that. And I think one of the cornerstones for actually, again, moving towards repeal is an understanding that people could drink alcohol in moderation and with food and family traditions and enjoy it. And so to me, it's all about taste and pairings. And I remember back at the Smithsonian, which was quite special, Yes. And you gave an incredible opening toast, bridging the gap between continents, between cultures, thinking of the American wine industry and how it's evolved and the French wine industry. And um, it was a wonderful sort of encapsulation, thinking again of how far the wine industry had come in America, which first was really celebrated by the great Paris tasting. Right. And the recognition of that. Um, but the Smithsonian invitation was quite unusual. Little did we know, as we embarked on our film, that they were working on their own food exhibit with wine included. Because right. again, looking at wine and thinking of food, for many of the winemakers, one of the most difficult aspects of accepting prohibition was because they felt wine was part of food, part of their diet, part of their uh, livelihood every day. It was a very natural, normal thing to have wine with meals. And so when the Smithsonian was looking at the history of food in America, they wanted to include wine as part of that story. And they learned about my film as they talked to more people and it became very clear that the way they were building their historical timeline, everything starts really in the modern industry with prohibition. So it was really wonderful as a coming together again and another synergy of being able to work with them. They were incredibly supportive and they gathered so many families from all over the country who are involved in the wine industry. So many leaders, executives, 
And it was a special night with congressional members and Mike Thompson was there. And that was really quite, quite special to think about the evolution of where wine had come in America and as part of their special food exhibit, which has been so prominent at the Smithsonian. And Paula Johnson, if you remember, was so instrumental in all of that. So, And you know, which I'm delighted is today is a remake of it because we serve this wine, which is part of the Viticultural Society branch of wine at Buena Vista, which really represents that first corporation that started to sell stocks to shareholders. And you know, in 18, in the mid 1860s, the big four from Northern California and San Francisco became shareholders of Buena Vista. And we did this amazing label to remember it, to commemorate the past. And that's the wine we together with Paula Johnson and all the great people at the Smithsonian enjoyed the meal with. So I'm delighted that we could have a little remake, Carla. <laughs> we are, thank you. And Carla, in addition to all those phenomenal uh, information that you so kindly shared, you are a true historian as well, a great mother and a fantastic historian. Remind us the importance of history to society today and why we should keep diving into our history and our past and how important it is. Well, thank you. I um, know you have a great affinity and love for history as well. And that's something we have always connected on. You can't really do, um, I think, all that you want, carve the best course out for the future, unless you really understand your past. And I think we've seen that lesson time and again. And I know you've even had that as your motto uh, in different ways with the wineries, mm -hmm. being informed by the past, understanding it and recognizing it as you learn those lessons and then move forward in the future. Um, so the sense we had about it is not only is it important to remember those events and understand how we arrived at the places we are today, but I also think that um, it is continuing to be relevant. And that's one reason when I thought about what should the title of the film be? America's Wine, The Legacy of Prohibition I felt was a nice phrase because the legacy continues today. And all that we discussed earlier, looking back and reflecting on those events have created the modern wine industry as we know it, which many people uh, are still working to understand, working on uh, you know, the, the bodies of laws, the different shipping requirements, as all states, because uh, the arrangement with repeal was that all the states could make their own rules and regulations on how alcohol would be sold and distributed in their state. That changed the fabric of how, uh, you know, wine could be uh, shared, uh, transported, sold, and there, there are many different uh, places that do it differently. So. Um, while there's been more of a uniformity over time in our laws, and I think the internet changed everything and direct shipping has changed everything, um, there's still a need to understand the complexities. That's so true. as someone in the industry, I think certainly that's you know something that you know front and center. I think it's been an education for many consumers in recent years yeah. to learn about that and understand that in American history. So, so much goes back to that period. And, and that's why I think history is so important to learn from and share and um, be able to then um, move forward the best way we can with those lessons. Well, on that note, do you actually think history, Carla, can repeat itself? Can we see possibly in America, which has adopted wine as its beverage of choice with meals, and loving it so much that it could eventually repeat itself? I think it's a really interesting and intriguing question. Um, I don't envision it on a national level, okay. given the daunting challenges of constitutional amendments and the fact that it was tried and it didn't work. And I think many of those concerns would still be relevant to how is it enforceable? 
Um, but to steal a line that I thought was so um, profound that Kevin Starr shared at the end of the film, culture determines our politics. And there was a cultural confusion on addressing this issue of wine's place in America, alcohol's place in America. Mm -hmm. So I think we have learned so much from that time, 87 more years of research, policy discussions, medical information that I think help us address some of the questions. Um, but I certainly think there will always be um, temperance or neo-prohibitionist uh, uh, movements or ideas that uh, will continue to be part of our cultural fabric. I think alcohol will continue to be debated in terms of its proper place and use in our society. And certainly I think, you know, uh, just to be clear for those listening, um, what we did was not an advocacy piece. It was an explainer of what happened in America, why this occurred, where we are today. Um, not intended to be um, supporting wine drinking for all. And certainly I think there are some people obviously who should not drink, choose not to drink, uh, whether it's medical or personal issues. And we respect that. Uh, this was not an advocacy piece um, in, a, in a marketing or advertising sense. And I think initially when I began the film, people not knowing the story were not clear. That's so right. I continue to explain, no, we're really looking at the history, the implications of history. And that was so important to me to get across. And so, you know, uh, I think we've learned a lot. And I would say, I don't see it uh, on a national level, but certainly people will have, um, I think different ideas and interest in alcohol, its use, and um, you know, or or whether there should be um, you know temperance uh, you know efforts, and that that will continue. I'm now relieved. <laughs> <laughs> it would be crazy to imagine that it can come again. But Carla, a very important point: you, born and raised on the West Coast, Italian descent family, where there's wine at the dinner table and possibly at the lunch table on the weekends as you gather probably for lunch as a family. You're an amazing mother, a great and phenomenal entrepreneurs with incredible vision. What do you recommend to all the mothers and fathers in the United States as far as how to make the children more sensitive about what this beverage of culture is all about and this essence of civilization is? And how to raise your children around wine in a responsible way. Well, thank you. In terms of my mother, I couldn't agree more. I am blessed to have the parents and the family that I've had uh, and the extended family, my brother, you know so well, my sister. So we were raised with a sense that um, wine was part of uh, not only um, uh, everyday uh, meals, but could be wonderful for celebrations, but with respect and with moderation and always with food. And so it wasn't mystifying. It wasn't um, something that was taboo where uh, my, my parents uh, from a young age in high school, they would uh, allow us to taste it, to try it at home with food, just so we were familiar. And I think you know all too well uh, most children uh, don't have a taste for it, are not interested in it. But that way, when we went off into the world in college, it wasn't something we were, um, you know, so curious about. We understood it. We understood its place with meals. Uh, it's a very European uh, sense of understanding where it fits in, in your lives if you are a family that chooses to drink alcohol with wine as... Um, you know, part of, of really, you know, looking at an extension of food. And, you know, as part of that also a uh, taste, you know, it's very complimentary, finishing a meal, pairing things together. So while that was not understood to me until much later, as I grew older, um, I had the exposure and the sense that um, it was a nice accompaniment that everyone could enjoy with food and um, I think that that's a very healthy approach um, for 
just um, education. I think there needs to be more education yes. and an emphasis on that. Um, and, and again, always with food. So that was the um, way my parents introduced us. Um, and, you know, it, later in life, uh, little did we all know that it would figure in in our, our various pursuits and careers. Exactly. Well, talking about this, we need to serve the red wine. And I feel, Carla, we need to have a little toast for your brother, Perry DeLuca. Absolutely. Because thanks to him as well, and Lou Girardo, another great friend, and Don Brain, we were all able to bring Buena Vista in our collection of winery, which as you know, was my obsession since the age of 11. And Perry, in his skillful manner and talented negotiating skills, made it happen. So I think we need to have a little toast for your brother who loves wine and drinks his fair share, that's for sure. <laughs> and even got married in a winery. So this is quite the dream. Yes, to my brother. And on that, Carla, you've had a very successful career. And many of us would love to hear about this in the news world. You know, you were a fabulous, successful lady on CNN and, uh, you know, very impactful in that world. And tell us about the news world and what is your view of its evolution? And I know it's a big question, <laughs> but it would be fascinating to hear about this as we taste. Uh, well, thank you very them. much. Um, you know, I was always behind the scenes. I was blessed to have um, the wonderful mentorship of so many people there, writers, producers, executives. Um, I was there at a time in the, the mid to late 90s when Ted Turner still owned the network and Tom Johnson was the CEO. Uh, there's so many others I could name who were instrumental in the success of CNN, which uh, had expanded its reach and everybody understood it was here to stay in an international news network. Um, so I just feel blessed that I had that opportunity mm -hmm to, as a young person, as a young producer, uh, be able to work with such outstanding people. I was able to work very closely with uh, anchors like Bobby Batista and Joey Chen and Miles O'Brien, uh, just outstanding people, mentors. And I think um, they really, uh, with the um, executives and the, the women that I was so lucky to work with, who were senior to me as producers, showed the way of how to create stories, tell them effectively. And it was such a team and effort true. and a team you know, uh, mentality. Uh, you can't produce the news alone. It is an entirely collaborative effort, no matter what your role, and everybody needs to be as strong as possible to be successful. So in terms of how um, it impacted me, you know, I did my best every day in covering news events, but I think it also gave me a lot of knowledge and understanding about how programming could be created, how images could be used, um, how you build, uh, you know, uh, the right elements in and the right ingredients so that a project will be successful. The visual elements are primary in order to sustain the story. Yes. So I learned a lot of that, which enabled me to do the film. And I would and oh. call out yes. on, on that phenomenal learning and all the fact finding and the accuracy of the news. You know, we just lived the year 2020, which was needless to say, quite chaotic, challenging and news may be worthy. I don't know. What do you think? Uh, well, you asked me that question, the evolution, and you're pointing out, you know, the, the challenges of this year. What I would say is there has been a tremendous um, new resurgence of understanding of the importance of our journalists. And I feel proud every day to watch CNN and other colleagues at other networks to be able to have news at our fingertips, which are devices allow, 
uh, I read avidly the New York Times, the Washington Post, and when I see the level and the quality of the journalists and how people are really understanding their, their role and how crucial it is as a public service, which was always the mantra of, at CNN that you were, you were not the star, the news was the star. Yes. And any way you could present and share and disseminate information effectively, that was your job. And I feel like we're seeing some of the finest journalism across the board tackling these very difficult times. Uh, I think unprecedented is not an exaggerated word. We're hearing it a lot, but it is apt for what we're experiencing. And I think, um, I feel like I just have the utmost respect for the journalists in television and in print who are just doing a phenomenal job to share up to date you know, up-to-date information with us daily. We're very lucky in America, and that is a cornerstone of our democracy, as we're all understanding, and the importance of being informed, informed citizens, informed voters, and uh, the importance of keeping up to date. So I think we're, we're seeing that resurgence from the public of understanding that and wanting to support our journalists, and I think we're seeing outstanding work from them. Absolutely. I will toast to that to you. You know, we selected that Zinfandel because where is the origin of Zinfandel? Is it Croatia or is it Northern Italy? What is your view on the accuracy of history here? Uh, you know, I looked that up and just it's funny you mention it because we hadn't talked about uh, this in any recent discussion, but I was thinking about that too. I don't know the answer. I know that there are roots that go back to both those cultures. Um, I think certainly California has embraced that, furthered it with our own traditions. The terroir here that you often talk about, the differences when you produce wine here versus in European countries. So I think now there is a unique, you know, Zinfandel of California, um, but I will leave it to the historians and experts like you uh, to, to tell us more about the origin. But I, I find it, um, it's fascinating. And, and one of the things I think about Buena Vista that was so interesting to me in learning the history is how the, the Count gathered such varietals across Europe, bringing them back to try them in the vineyards to see what would be effective in California. And you know, it's, it's really phenomenal as, um, you know, an effort. Um, and I think it's through efforts like that that led to our understanding of what grows well here and helped to develop the modern wine industry. Well, so, so well said. And I will echo Charles Sullivan, who said in his book, Sonoma and the History of Buena Vista, that the Count of Buena Vista, as you kindly said, brought Zinfandel from Europe through New Jersey and then to California. So at least we're drinking the true historical wine and vineyards that really define today, as you said, so well the identity of what America and California is, that great Zinfandel wine. So whether it's Italy, Northern Veneto, whether it's Croatia, whether those Dalmatian beautiful mountains you know, welcome this, whether this was one country when that grew, we know it's coming from Europe, but now it's what America is about. So on, on America, Carla, you know, we've lived obviously a unique year and you're a great inspiration. You keep to think forward. I would like as a closing message for you to share your wiseness and your fabulous personality to all of us around the world as we turning the page of 2020 key learnings moving into 2021 what's your message for all of us wow that's a big question uh you've asked but a few nothing is big enough for you i know <laughs> you will surmount it with excitement and inspiration well i think for those of us who are fortunate, who've had our health through this period, um, I see a wonderful sense of the importance of really uh, the key people in your life, your family, your friends, your neighbors, 
those who are closest to us. And I think with that, anytime there is a time of strife and difficulty, there is a renewed sense of appreciation for those in our circle. And I feel like we're seeing that a lot of caring, a lot of reaching out, a lot of people going the extra mile to help. And even you know when this dreadful pandemic began, so many people immediately were thinking about their own businesses. What could they do to help? Creating masks and changing their operations. How could they serve others? What could they do for food? The restaurateurs and um, you know the challenges they have faced in the restaurant world. And yet so many have persevered and stayed open and also given of themselves to feed and help others. So during these difficult times, I like to think of how we care for each other mm -hmm. and how we appreciate each other. And I hope we'll continue to have those lasting lessons especially you know, as our children understand and have weathered this with us, um, they will remember this time. We will remember this time. And while there are such difficult things to experience and remember, I hope there will also be a sense of us pulling together and helping each other. Ooh la la. This is not only powerful, inspirational, and of course, so wise and so true. And I thank you so much, Carla, for being with us today and enlightening us on prohibition, on your history, your family, on wine, of the vision of California, on, of course, being a great family member of an incredible family, of being in the news and telling us all those wise messages. So, Carla, thank you for accepting to be with us today. We have so many people now who want to meet you, so I'm thrilled. And thank you as well. And you'll see all that dear friends uh, send to you some links to Carla's incredible film and all the things she's done. So Carla DeLuca herself, can I raise my glass to you? <laughs> to you, Jean-Charles. Josephine, oh. your mother and your father and all the DeLuca family for being such a phenomenal inspiration and leaders in California and America. Oh, Jean-Charles, back to you, your entire family, uh, the Boisses, the Gallows. Um, I'm so honored to be with you today, and thank you so much for the invitation to share this time with you. So best to all of you for um, as much joy as possible through this holiday season. And to America, cheers. <laughs> Happy holidays. <laughs>